Racism is the lowest, most crudely primitive form of collectivism. Ayn Rand, The Virtue of Selfishness. Hello again, and welcome back. Let's continue our journey through history's greatest and most important novel. Our hero's ultimate defeat in the second part of Don Quixote arrives as something of a shock to most readers in chapter 64. Why here? Why now? What does this mean? Four aspects of the context of his defeat would seem important. First, according to the narrator, the wife of Antonio Moreno is delighted to have Ana Felix in her house. This sounds like more criticism of the expulsion of the Moriscos. Second, according to the same narrator, Don Quixote is hyperbolic in his desire to defeat Moors. Echoing the tone and content of his advice in part one, he says he is the one to save Gregorio, and echoing his violent destruction of Maese Pedro's puppet show, he compares his plan to Gaifero's rescue of Melisendra from Zaragoza. It would be better for them to take him to the Barbary coast with his arms and horse, and he would rescue the young man in spite of the Moorish hordes, just as Don Gaiferos had done for his wife Melisendra. The question of which type of foreign policy to deploy is front and center here. Third, Sancho sounds eminently reasonable, objecting to his master's plan on two grounds. First, Gaifero's act took place on land, whereas rescuing Gregorio requires crossing the sea. Second, he trusts the go-between figure of the renegade. I trust the renegade, who seems to me a very honest man, very solid inside. In other words, Sancho voices a less aggressive policy, noting that the Reconquista was a territorial matter, but that times have changed. Fourth, when the general of the galley departs, heading east into the Mediterranean, he begs the Viceroy of Barcelona to keep him informed about whatever happened concerning the liberty of Don Gregorio and the case of Ana Felix. Is this a plea to give peace a chance? as if a strong defense were important, but that it should no longer be used for aggression? Did you know? Thomas Jefferson would wage war on the Barbary states in the first Barbary War of 1801 to 1805. In this context, consider the identity of the knight who defeats Don Quixote as well as the location of their battle. On the beach of Barcelona again, Don Quixote saw a knight approaching him, also in full armor, and who carried a shining moon on his shield. When this knight challenges Don Quixote to a duel, we learn his name. He is the Knight of the White Moon. Clearly, Don Quixote is confronting Islam at the final limits of Spanish territory. Adding to this sense of climactic destiny, we should also recall Don Quixote's battle with the Knight of the Mirrors in Don Quixote Part 2, Chapter 14, whose armor was associated with the moon, many small moons made of shining mirrors, as well as his encounter with the allegorical knight of Don Quixote Part 2, Chapter 11, who was also a knight in full armor. When the Knight of the White Moon declares to Don Quixote the conditions of their battle, we note themes that have dominated both parts of the novel. Don Quixote's administration of his estate, as well as his soul, are at stake. If you fight and I defeat you, I want no other satisfaction than that, abandoning your arms and abstaining from seeking new adventures, you will withdraw and retire to your village for the period of a year in which you shall live without laying a hand on a sword and in tranquil peace and profitable serenity, for such is required for the increase of your household and the salvation of your soul. In other words, Don Quixote's challenger demands that our Hidalgos submit to Aristotelian and biblical common sense. I am focusing on how this episode relates to Cervantes' critique of Spanish politics and values. By contrast, Romantic readers focus on the overt cause of the battle, which is, of course, the fact that the Knight of the White Moon claims his mistress is more beautiful than Dulcinea. The hilarity, as well as the moral, of all of this stems from the fact that the identity of the rival mistress does not matter. 
I come to do battle with you and to test the strength of your arms with the goal of making you recognize and confess that my beloved, whomever she may be, is without comparison more beautiful than your Dulcinea of Toboso. I see no reason why the political implications of the episode cannot be reconciled with the romantic ones. The identity of the beloved does not affect her beauty. It is as if the Knight of the White Moon had learned from Don Quixote's insight in chapter 25 of point one that the ethnicity of his beloved is irrelevant. Perhaps this is one of the reasons he is victorious. Quixotic mission. What is the reason for Don Quixote and the Knight of the White Moon's battle? A, the length of their respective lances. B, the size of their respective boots. C, the beauty of their respective ladies. Correct answer, C, the beauty of their respective ladies. So the battle takes place before Don Antonio, the Viceroy, and a host of other knights. Don Quixote is defeated, and anticipating the romantic hero, he refuses to yield, preferring death to having to admit that Dulcinea is inferior to any other damsel. Note that this time, opposite what happened with the Knight of the Mirrors, it's Don Quixote who cannot lift his visor. Notice also the heavy presence of the theme of death. Don Quixote thrashed and stunned without raising his visor and as if speaking from within a tomb with a weak and feeble voice said, Dulcinea of Toboso is the most beautiful woman on earth and I'm the most unfortunate knight on earth and it is not right that my weakness should undo that truth. Take up your lance, knight, and take my life, for you have already taken my honor. The knight of the white moon refuses to kill our hero, insisting on the terms of their original agreement, and he turns about and enters Barcelona. Sancho is as sad as anyone. He saw his lord defeated and obliged not to take up arms for a year. He imagined the light of his glorious achievements dimmed, the hopes of his latest promises undone, just like smoke is undone by the wind. Notice, however, the pun involved in his concern that his master might have been deslocado. This means that Don Quixote might have dislocated a shoulder or broken a bone, but it also means something like de-twisted, alluding to the idea that Don Quixote has finally been cured of his insanity. That's all for now. Find out what happens with our characters in the final chapters of this fascinating text. If you liked this video and want to continue learning more about the knight errant Don Quixote de la Mancha, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel here. Also, you can enroll in our free online course on Don Quixote by clicking here.